Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. We are here once again, 3.46 p.m. Wednesday, March 13th, for another market close. Today has been a very exciting day in the broader equity and crypto markets. It's a typical Wednesday. Didn't expect anything to be too crazy. We got a CARP interview that we're going to react to and talk about in a little bit, um, that uh, we all knew he was going to be on CNBC, but we didn't expect him to say what he said. I'll have a full video coming out later on the channel, kind of just dissecting the entire interview, but we're going to watch some clips of it. That interview, if you watch that interview and you somewhat care about AI and you do not have Pounder in your portfolio, I don't know what's ever going to make you buy Pounder. I mean, that it was one of the most phenomenal interviews, not just for us. We got the bangers. We got the one-liners. We got the, you know, the we're going to burn down the shorts, which is what he literally said. We also got the actual explanation of where he sees AI going five years from now. And if you're an investor or if you're a C-suite listening to him talk, you're giving a call to Palantir and trying to figure out how you can implement that platform into your business. So we got to react to that. Uh, number two, obviously Bitcoin, 73,000. Ethereum right under 4,000. Bitcoin hit 73,700. It almost made a run at 74,000. So some interesting news there. Robinhood, 4.05 p.m. We get the new numbers. Very, very interested to see what their February data looks like. Robinhood basically held up pretty much at 17 all day. It peaked at like 17.30. Uh, markets falling a little bit into the close. We've got 13 minutes left right now. 17.13, still up 5% on the day. Actually outpacing Coinbase, which is not too bad. NVIDIA right now, 9.08. Uh, Coinbase here is down 1%. So Robin is actually going uh, up 5%. Pound here, $25.10. That's up 1.64%. All of that to say, there's still one thing we have to talk about to start off the market close, which I didn't think we would have to start talking about in the beginning. I thought we would get to it later because we already have so much uh, Pound here news. But folks, I think we got to talk about it. Tesla stock is underneath $170. And that is the first thing we're going to start talking about getting into this market close. What's going on? Why is it happening? I mean, we know in the morning that Wells Fargo downgraded the stock to 125. That price target really got this, the, the, the street upset. Uh, they got retail upset. The technicals already weren't looking great for Tesla. And now you got Tesla here as Volatile says in the chat. Tesla is now below $170. Thank you everybody for being here today. We're going to get super, we're going to get into it and see what we've got going on. Before I begin, let's play a very quick clip from Dan Ives. One minute on what he thinks is going on with Tesla right now. And then we're going to talk about a particular YouTuber who is now shorting Tesla publicly. Here we go. Actually come back to Tesla and just have you respond to this Wells Fargo note today. Questioning, obviously, significant discounts, profit per car coming way down, and their price target at Wells now, I think, 125. Yeah, we strongly disagree with them. I obviously respect the analysts and the call, but I think right now, overly negatively discounted in terms of the Tesla story. Look, near term, clearly, units are going to be soft for 1Q. Just getting back from the region, I believe price cuts are now starting to subside in China. That's important. I think when you look through the next six, nine months, we're going to look at this as more of a golden buying opportunity for Tesla over the next two, three years, especially with AI, rather than the time to throw in the white towel. But for now, we all know, I mean, the New York City cab driver is bearish on Tesla here. <laughs> what does that mean? Sorry. <laughs> Every, look, everyone's bearish. The piling on's there. The bears are coming out of hibernation mode. I get I it. Yeah. But we believe now is not time to throw in the towel on oh, Tesla and yeah. Apple. I think we see there six, nine months now. Stock's much higher. I think we all agree with him, right? It's not like we don't agree with Dan Ives that the stock will probably be higher six to nine months. The question is entry price. Now, if you're waiting for 150 versus 170, is it that big of a deal? Maybe not if you think the stock's going to 300, 350, right? It's not that big of a deal. However, we know what retail sentiment is like. We know what institutional sentiment is like. The sentiment around Tesla from retail and institutional is not good. It's just not good. And as a result of that, we have one of the biggest influencers in the financial ecosystem on social media, someone who manages... I think like $50 million in his own public ETF. Mr. Meet Kevin is officially short Tesla. This was surprising to see. I mean, I know Kevin, uh, it, it can be a little, you know, he has his decisions. He goes back and forth. Sometimes people say he flip-flops a lot. It is what it is when you're investing, right? You have to make decisions very quickly and you got to do what you got to do. But I didn't think he would do this because Tesla's the biggest thing in his fund. Now, Tesla's still the biggest position in his fund. However, he has significantly trimmed. So this, I got this email today. Uh, he sold bill.com. He sold Enfei, sold Tesla, uh, sold a couple other companies and he bought restoration hardware and he bought Wayfair. And then he has 36% in cash. 
Now, Tesla is still the largest position at 16% of the portfolio and Bayes at uh, 12%, NVIDIA at 13.3%. So the fund, by the way, let me check the fund right now, PP. Um, it's down 1.8% today, even though NVIDIA's up or NVIDIA's past 900 because obviously it's very heavily weighted to Tesla and Enphase and those companies via interest rates are just not doing that well. He has some palantir in there, but he is now going short on Tesla and his logic, he made a video about it. And uh, the video, I, I didn't get to watch the entire thing, but the gist of what I got from the video is that he believes that inflation data is not good enough for the Fed to cut anytime soon. And if the Fed is not cutting anytime soon, then obviously, um, well, Tesla is going to be not in the best situation because demand is not going to go up. If the Fed doesn't cut rates, margins are definitely not going to go up. Deliveries, Dan Ives thinks 2.1 million. So that's a 16% CAGR will still happen. Um, but but it, it, if it doesn't, then you're looking at maybe 10% growth year over year with, with deliveries. And that's not the best for Tesla. And so there's a lot of FUD, one could argue, or there's a lot of real arguments, one could argue. For where Tesla's going. Now look, Wells Fargo 125, I think that's FUD. I don't think that's happening. I think the narrative that Tesla is dead, it's done for, it's like going to shit. Like I don't like people are saying it's going to 69 bucks. Like I don't know if that's just a joke or people really believe that. I don't think that's happening. But is there some pain around the corner? I mean, yeah, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that if rates don't go up or rates don't go down, there's gonna be a little bit more margin compression. And it's gonna be tough. Inbound says justifiable FUD. Yep. And inbound's a very big, I know you're a very big Tesla bull. So I think even the Tesla bulls are coming out and saying, look, it's a little tough. Now it doesn't help that Elon is uh, tweeting a lot about other things that's kind of pissing off investors. He's not really addressing the, some of the problems in Tesla. Now, look, he doesn't have to address a 5% up or down thing in, in the stock, right? Like you probably don't want him going crazy over that. But when you're kind of talking about everything other than Tesla, I think even the biggest of bulls are getting a little annoyed, right, about what's happening with Tesla. And that's why we're seeing some downside momentum on top of the fact that the technicals just look horrible when it comes to Tesla. And it does look like the, me, Kevin, made a particular point that breaking 176 today was one of the uh, core elements of that Fibonacci retracement. And I don't know exactly what that means. I will learn what that means in the next couple of months. Going to be honest here, but I will learn that over the next couple of months. Look at MicroStrategy up 10%. But from his perspective on the technicals, it's just not the best thing for Tesla to go below 176 based on that retracement. And now you're at 169. So from a TA perspective, a male astrology perspective, this thing's heading lower. He thinks maybe 150, 155 is in the near future for Tesla. And so that's what we got going on. That's what we got going on. In the context of Tesla, and uh, 165 was the low from a few months ago. Correct, 165 was a lo low from a few months ago, and the idea that we don't see that again—I mean, that could happen. That absolutely could happen. Damien says, "My wife is asking me why I'm not listening to her." The answer is simple: <laughs> because I'm listening to a bit, dude. This is what we've got to do. We've got to make this a thing now. Uh, this is this is how this is how we need to. This is how we need to build. Dylan says, Amit is like the stock market Howard Stern. At first, you tune in, and if you like him, you keep watching. Like me, at first, I was like, I don't know about this guy. I watched, and now I'm hooked. That's it. That's 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 the goal. That's the that's the long-term growth trajectory. When I do my Q1 earnings, that that that's the type of comment that's going to be the ethos of my earnings on this channel, probably at the end of March. Also, quick announcement, real quick, and then we'll get into what's going on with uh, Pounder, and we'll end the Tesla conversation. The interview I told you guys that was going to happen, it's happening. I just got off a meeting right before the uh, live stream. It is booked. It is official. It is happening. Uh, end of March, I will be in New York City doing the interview, and I'll probably be posting it very early April, and uh, we're good to go. So it'll be a fun one. I think you guys will enjoy it and we'll we'll see how it plays out. But that is definitely happening as of today. All right. So now Tesla 169. Am I buying the dip? Quite frankly, no. You know what I'd rather buy? I'd rather buy pound here. And because if there is more downside momentum for Tesla, you know, one Tesla share can get you what? Four or five shares of uh, a pound here? I don't know, dude. It kind of just feels like momentum is on the side of pound here. I would like to get a lot more shares before Q1. I think Q1, given what Carp has said over the past couple of, of uh of basically of of uh of days and of interviews is going to crush and as a result of that i think we might be in for a good q1 whereas for tesla you know you're not going to be in for the best q1 and for that reason i'm not really going heavy on pound or on tesla right now here's a quick clip uh we're not going to react to the entire interview but we'll, we'll do it after the market close because we got a bunch of stuff to get into but here's a quick preview of what carp said on the interview and why he's like going viral on social media right now. Here we go.
Talk about the most epic line that I've ever heard Carp say. So I've got the full quote right, right here. I just want to read it again because it's uh, you might have missed exactly what he said here. I love burning the short sellers. Like almost nothing makes a human happier than taking the lines of Coke away from these short sellers that are going short on a truly great American company, which is Palantir. They love pulling down American companies so they can pay for their Coke. The best thing that can happen for them is we will lead their Coke dealers to their homes after they can't pay their bills. That, that, that's called a margin call, dude. That's called a freaking margin call. Do your thing. We will do our thing. I think Carp woke up this morning and he said, you know what? On this interview, because we have a different, uh, we get a different type of carp in a variety of interviews, right? When he's doing keynotes, he's different. When he's doing interviews on in conferences in Europe, he's different. On CNBC, he typically tends to be more animated and more excited, uh, especially you know when the results are good and you've got you can talk your talk. And uh, we got that version of carp today. And so uh, Sarah Eisen, the interviewer, and she said, uh, you know, the stock's doing well. What do you have to say to the short sellers? He immediately goes on this tirade about about short sellers being high on coke to even think of shorting Palantir, which by the way, uh, empirically, he's correct. The short float is down 5% from two weeks ago. They are 97 million short, sh shares short of a 2.1 billion share company. It's not like there's not enough shares to borrow. <laughs> the shares are out there. We got uh, 2.1 billion of them. Uh, under 100 million shares short to me is the most exciting thing ever. Palantir falling a little bit right now, 24.98. I did buy like 20 more shares today in the 2485 ish range. So it just, 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 I'm just stacking up whatever I have, just adding some more. And uh, to me, it's becoming very evident. The stock did balloon to like 2540 after that interview. I think Wall Street was looking at that interview. Yes, retail probably bought off of Carp being excited, but I do think Wall Street was watching that interview and they were like, dude, this guy is not messing around when he says that Pounder is something unique. A couple of other quotes, and then after the bell, and we go through a bunch of things, we'll go through the entire interview and we'll we'll just watch it together. Um, so a couple of things here. Um, uh, Carp said executives in the U S are using Palantir, calling their business executive friends overseas and telling them to buy Palantir software. So his argument is he's being told by C-suites that they are calling their, um, uh, C-suite friends across the world. And they're saying, Hey, if you don't have Palantir software, I don't know what you're doing. Another quote. He said a couple years ago, we were doing 70 to 90, 90 pilots a year. Now we are doing 20 X that amount with boot camps. When asked what has led to do the 20X, which he's correct. I mean, they're, they're doing about 20X, those boot camps. We just saw they did 850 in the last uh, update. Carp says, we're just showing people the value. I mean, look, I, I, it's getting to a point where this is, this is what I wrote on Twitter, and then we'll get to the market close. I said, I don't know how anyone watches Carp and doesn't walk away inspired and at least a little curious about Palantir stock. If you care about AI and want to invest in software companies with high gross margins and don't consider Palantir, I genuinely think you will be sad a decade from now. There is no single leader in corporate America that can accentuate and communicate a message like he can about the future of software, AI, technology, and more importantly, how to provide value to clients in order to hit massive scale. I mean, this is a guy who told investors to his face, we don't have an effing pricing strategy. At the end of the day, all you can ask for is honesty from someone you're investing in. You're investing in people at the end of the day. You're investing in Bob Iger at Disney. You're investing in Elon Tesla. You're investing in Alex Karp for a pound here. He told us he doesn't have a pricing strategy. And those who wanted to walk away, they walked away. And somehow he told us the truth. He didn't sugarcoat it. And he executed against that thesis by building a platform that creates value, which is why he didn't need a pricing strategy. It is the most amazing thesis that I've seen play out over the past couple of years in the stock market. And granted, I followed this company very deeply, but I don't know a company that falls from 45 to six and then makes its way back to 25, basically by innovating in sales, which is something they're not used to doing. 4 p.m. March 13th. Thank you everybody for being here. The stock market is now closed. All right, let's see what we've got going on. We got a lot of things to discuss, folks. In, in five minutes, we get the Robinhood numbers as well. So that is big on the docket today. We have path earnings as well. So we'll take a look at those numbers and we'll see what's going on. I've got Robinhood pulled up here on the side. Uh, March 13th, today's the day we should get those numbers. And so in a little bit, we'll look at those numbers. Pound here, 25 bucks, 1.21% up on the day. MicroStrategy, a hell of a day, 10.85%. A hell of a day. Philip says cowbell in my veins. I love it. <laughs> the cowbell is absolutely now in my veins. It's here. Uh, Square as well. Speaking of Philip, I know he's a he's a he's a square bull. This one's up five percent on the day. By the way, PayPal as well. PayPal had a great day. PayPal right now sixty two forty five up four percent of the day. At one point it, it peaked at sixty three thirty, 
uh, the CFO was at some conference. I, I should have streamed it. I didn't even know it was happening, but I would have streamed it if I, if I knew in the market open. And basically the dude was just like, yeah, we're going to take all 5 billion. We make a free cash flow and buy back the stock. So I think investors were like, all right, well, if you're going to buy back 7% of the company, maybe we should buy back the stock as well. So, uh, that's why PayPal is up SMCI up 2% of the day. Nvidia closed at 908. Uh, it was down 1% of the day, but still closed above 900, which is really good. Uh, Hims 1512 up 3.4% of the day. Coinbase fell down a little bit. Not sure exactly why. Um, I guess people just took some profits, no kind of catalyst or the convertible debt. I don't think that was that big of a deal, but Coinbase, uh, down a little bit on the day. S and P basically flat down 0.15%, uh, Robin at 1713 up 4.7% on the day. Uh, da, 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 da. SMH, this one was down 2%. Bitcoin 73, 356. It's kind of crazy, right? Cause the euphoria around Bitcoin now that we're at like an all time high at 73,000, it's like kind of no one cares. You notice that? Like, I know people care, but it's not like. It's not like you're walking outside and everyone's talking about it, which is what it felt like in 2021. So maybe that suggests retail is not back, which is why this thing's going to get even crazier. Uh, so we'll talk more about Bitcoin in a little bit, but Bitcoin right now, 73,350. We'll see where that goes from there. PayPal, again, 6245. Path is on the docket today. Path is up 1% after hours. Let me pull up their earnings. They're probably not out yet because it takes them a second. But let me pull up their numbers or at least their website and see uh what we have right here okay newsroom pat yeah it's not out yet it might, it might take a little bit it might take a couple minutes robin hood numbers are not out yet either those numbers are going to be very very important and we'll see what happens uh eric says the mid-coin is down because of dilution i would agree with you eric but in the morning coinbase was up four percent like the market didn't care so i guess towards the end of the day maybe the, to me i think the market doesn't care at all they're just taking some profits because it got a little it got a little up there at 270 but that that, that might be a reason why it's coming down the semis uh today also not the greatest day obviously nvidia did well smci did well but all the rest of these guys were down amd and wow amd was down four percent i didn't know that amd was down four percent i didn't even look at that today so amd is down and then crypto stocks i didn't pay attention to the miners clean spark ended up four percent on the day okay so that's good for clean spark micro strategy obviously 10 percent on the day marathon was down so clean spark is one of the only miners that had a really good day and all the other ones Cy oh cypher that was up seven percent and then iren was down a little bit 0.61 percent hud eight mining also up eight percent but clean spark here up four percent that was a good day um okay do we have robin hood numbers yet do we have the hood numbers yet oh okay robin hood's moving it's up one percent after hours 0.87 percent do we have the numbers i don't have the numbers yet not on my side um yeah, not on my side yet. No, no numbers yet. But Robinhood is up after hours, 1750. All right, it's moving. It's up 2%. Okay, so Bloomberg got the numbers. The terminal has the numbers. We don't have the numbers yet. Uh, it, but, but obviously someone has the numbers. That's why it's going up. So I'm waiting for the numbers, but I don't have it. Um, it's up 2% right now, 1750. Path numbers are not out yet. Where's the stock? The stock is, the stock is flat. It's up 0.78%. Yeah, that, those numbers aren't coming out for a bit. Or at least not now. Um, okay, so here we go. Robin it up 2.16%. So someone has the numbers. Someone has the numbers. I don't have the numbers. You don't have the numbers. But the big boys have the numbers. And so the big boys are like, you know what? The numbers seem good enough for us to buy it. And that's why the stock is pumping right now after hours. Now, we'll see how long it lasts. Uh, but if the numbers are good, dude, it doesn't matter if Robin goes to fucking 14. If the numbers are good, Q1 is going to crush. And so that's all that really matters to me. Uh, now, granted, getting back to 14 is going to be tough if the numbers are good, but that would be a dip that I would like if it happens. Uh, Soundhound, Soundhound, let me look at that real quick. Robin and number still not in yet. Soundhound, wow, Soundhound is up 24% today. Why is Soundhound up 24%? Goodness, what the hell happened here? This fellow is like, it's just random right here. There's, there, I don't, unless they put out a press release. Uh, Mitchell says, Robin Hood customer service is way too slow. Have you tried the chat bot? Because the chatbot gets back to me in like five minutes. Some people try to call them. If you just message the chatbot, uh, like the dude responds really quickly. So, uh, and it's not AI, it's an actual person. So I would recommend going through that if you if you really want to see something quickly or get results quickly. Um, okay, I still don't have the numbers. I still don't have the numbers. They're not out yet. Let me, let me check on Twitter and see if they're out. Uh, uh, Path also, numbers are not out. Path did a partnership with the Saudi Arabia Ministry of Tourism. That's the latest update I have on them. But nothing else yet. Um, okay, on Twitter, the hood numbers. No, no one has the numbers yet. No one has them yet. Not on Twitter. At least I don't see them yet. Uh, yeah, still not out yet. Uh, Tesla right now, after hours, Tesla is 
Uh, 169.4. Tesla still down after hours, down about 5% of the day, still down right now. S&P up a little bit after hours. Coinbase up a little bit after hours as well. Robin it up 1.8% right now after hours. Path is up 6%. Okay, so someone has the numbers on path. Someone has the numbers on path. We don't have the numbers on path because we don't have $25,000 to spend on the Bloomberg terminal, but eventually we will. And then we'll get the numbers immediately. All right, 6%. I don't have path numbers. Let me check on Twitter if someone has path numbers. Um, Path numbers. No, no one has it. Retail does not have it. It is not. Oh, De but Deloitte apparently is doing a new partnership with them. So they have some piece of news that came out for that. And the official number is not there yet. Let, oh, who, ha who has path in the chat? They're up 3% right now. Who has path in the chat? Let me know. Who has this thing? Who has this thing? It's robotic processing automation. It's kind of like a digital twin for you know uh, your data. It's like a pseudo version of Foundry, but much, much thinner than that. And mainly targeting... SMBs. So here's the, the page I'm looking at, guys. This is what I'm looking at for the Robin and numbers. Oh, a lot of people have path. Wow. A lot of people have path. Um, okay. So this is the this is the one that should be there. Quarterly results. We don't need that. We need press releases. Yeah, still not there. And then financials, monthly metrics, still not. Oh, it's there. Okay, it's out. Here we go. Here we go. It is officially out. We're looking at it right now. 130,000 customers. Okay. Last month they added 130,000 accounts. Assets under custody, wow, it jumped 16 billion. That's big. Deposits, 3.6 billion. Oh, you guys can't see this. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Share the staff. Here you go, here you go. Deposits, 3.6 billion. That means so far we have done 7.4 billion in deposits. Last quarter, we only did 4.6. Cash sweep is up 2 billion. Okay, here's the big one, crypto trading. Oh boy, there you go. Crypto trading volumes, that's up 500 million. It went from 5.9 billion to 6.5 billion on crypto trading volumes. Wow, equity. Holy crap. Look at the equity one. Look at the equity one. L <laughs> Dude, the equity one is insane. The equity one is, it went from 59 billion to $80 billion. 59 billion to 89 billion. Options went from 106 to 119. That's up 12% month over month. Uh, month over month change is 36% in the uh, in the equity volumes. And then margin, that's up to uh, 200 million. And then crypto, that's up 500 million. Oh boy, those are those are pretty crazy numbers. Stock right now, after hours, is up 1%. It makes sense that it's up 1%. Tomorrow, that bad boy might try to break 1780. I think that's very possible. Let me see the press release they put out. Let's see the press release they put out. Let's see the press release and see what they say. We're going to see how much stock lending revenue they had as well. So share this tab. You guys can see it. Yes, you guys can see it. Oh boy, these are big numbers. These are big, big numbers. So uh, I think it's just a summary of their stuff. Yep. So crypto volumes were up 10%. Uh, equities are, are, are up 12%. Or Sorry, equities are up 36%. A lot of the Bitcoin ETFs probably played a role there. Options are up 12%. Total cash sweep. Uh, balances were 18 billion. Securities lending revenue, wow, 13 million. Last quarter, they only did 12 million. So they did another 1 million on top of that, 12 to 13. There you go, 12 to 13 million. Uh, stock right now, 1730. Funded customers up 130,000. Last month, they added 120,000. So they added 130,000 new accounts in the month of February and March. If they keep that up, they're going to have close to a, a, a three to 400,000 quarter in terms of just customers. And assets under custody as well, that's up 16%. Uh, to 118 billion net deposits, 3.6 billion. There you go. Not bad. Not bad at all. We'll get back to them in a second. Path, I'm trying to get these numbers. I don't have them yet. I still do not have them. Let's go to Twitter. Twitter should hopefully have them. Um, is Path down now? Uh oh. Is Path down? Is Path getting hit? Path, no, Path's up 12%. That's great. Path's up 12%. Dude, how does no one have the numbers on Twitter? How are these numbers not out yet? Um, still not on the website, still not on Twitter. Still not on Twitter. They raised guidance. Some people are saying that and they have good earnings, but I don't have the actual numbers. But there we go. Let's check on CNBC and see it as well. Uh, does Hood have a desktop version or just a mobile app? It has both. The desktop version is not as good as the mobile app, but they're trying to work on that. So there you go. Path is up. Oh, wow. Dude, Path was up 12%. Now it's up 2%. That changed literally. You guys saw that, right? That changed literally in two seconds. Literally in two seconds. These are February numbers, correct? Correct. For Robin, these are February numbers. These are February numbers. Palantir down a little bit after hours. Soundhound is up 3% after hours. Path is now negative. What happened, dude? What just happened? It just was up 12%. You guys saw that, right? I'm not crazy. I saw a path at up 
I think, that, yeah, the, the Alex in the chat, path was up 10%. Goodness gracious, dude. What the heck happened? What did they say? Why did the market react so suddenly to the upside? Like, it's like, it's like the market only gets like, like, like a couple of metrics and then, and then they get the whole picture. It's so weird how this thing happens. It's a PayPal moment. Yeah, it's literally a PayPal moment, dude. It's almost down 7% right now. Down. Uh, okay, it's recovering a little bit. It might end up just being flat for the day. Now, look, look at this. Now it's going to go green. <laughs> what the fuck is that? Dude, this market is so weird. This market is so weird. NVIDIA's up after hours. Okay, let's look back at Robinhood. Robinhood is up 1%. Look, the Robinhood numbers are pretty damn good. Robinhood numbers are pretty damn good. Uh, I expected a little bit more on the user side. I thought they would add a little bit more users. So that's okay. Uh, 130,000 users last year, they could barely get, when I mean barely, I think they could barely get 25,000 users a quarter, forget a month, a quarter. If they're getting plus a hundred thousand a month, I think that's big news, dude. And here's the big thing you have to look at, um, in the context of Robinhood is this, is this, uh, this equity notional trading volume that's up 36%. That's a lot. That is a lot. Net deposits, we knew that number, 3.6 billion. They're, they could get zero deposits in March and they could already be double or close to double what they were last quarter. They're going to get probably another 3 billion. So that's going to be a $9 billion quarter. And then crypto 6.5 billion, I think that's going to be even crazier. Uh, remember in 2021, dude, they had like $10 billion, $15 billion quarters of, of trading volume. They're not even halfway there yet. So crypto still has a lot of room to grow. And then on equities, 59 to 80, look at, look at this chart. Do you see this chart? From, from January, 2023, up until January, 2024, the most we ever did was 70 billion. And that was one month in July in the summer where the Fed uh, paused interest rates. Since then, we've never got into 80 billion. And that was in one month. That was not in one quarter. So really exciting stuff in the context of, uh, in the context of Robinhood. Adam, thank you for the super chat. I was just on the phone with Adam. Buy a share of Robinhood on me. Great job. You were hustling all the time. Crazy work ethic. We are going to make it community. I was just on the phone with Adam and we were talking about uh, some of the positions that he's in, that he's doing decently well at. So I love you, Adam. Thank you for being here so much. It means the world to me. And I will be buying a Robinhood share with, uh, with that 1780. So thank you for that. Uh, okay, Path, here we go. Thank you, Ali, for these numbers. First quarter, fiscal 2025, UI Path. Revenue expects 330 million to 335 million in the range of 1.5 billion to 1.513. So it looks like the guidance is up, but not up as much as the street wanted. Robinhood right now, 1744. Path is wow, guys. Path is up 12%. We just saw Path go from 12% down to 6%, now up 12%. Dude, what is going on? Let me see if CNBC has any coverage on these guys. Uh, and see what they're saying. And then we'll we'll react to the Carp interview because I know a lot of people didn't get a chance to see it. We'll watch it. Um, but let's see what CNBC has to say here. Do they have any coverage here on Path? Let's see. Let's see. UI Path. Oh, he's here. He's here. Okay, we got it. We got it. We got coverage. All right. Here we go. Here's Path. Let's see what they're doing. And again, let me know if you are in the chat, if you have Path and your thoughts on these earnings. Here we go. Q4 revenue of $405 million. That beat estimates of $384 million. No EPS number given, but first quarter of gap profitability as a public company. Uh, if, if you take a look at that, it was gap operating income of $15 million, non-gap $111 million, positive free cash flow adjusted non-gap as well. Annual recurring revenue of $1.464 billion. This was up 22% year on year. It was a little bit ahead of the consensus on fact set. Q1 revenue guidance of 330 to $335 million. That's a little light, but full year revenue slightly ahead of expectations at 1.55 to $1.6 billion. Now, I spoke with UiPath CFO Ashim Gupta about the setup for fiscal 2025. Have a listen. We're seeing continued strong demand across our customer base. Customers like TD Bank, as an example, they're expanding our AI, our AI infused platform across their operations to drive changes in customer experience. We ended this year with 288 customers. That's been more than a million dollars with us. That is up 26%. That momentum is carrying forward into fiscal year 25. What we're hearing is people don't want digital transformation. They want AI transformation. And that is giving rise to the, the need for business automation platforms, which is what UiPath is. The demand for AI and automation together 
provides really strong ROI, and that gives us a lot of confidence heading into the year, which is why you see us raising our total year guidance for both revenue while continuing to create profitability by increasing our non-GAAP operating margins by 100 basis points. So Gupta saying macroeconomic variability, it's impacting lower end enterprise customers, sub $100,000. It's the reason UiPath is actually focusing on lean. Dude, that's the type of CFO I would want to invest in. I don't know that much about Path, but the way he sounded right here, his confidence, the way he was talking, he sounds like he knows what the hell he's doing when it comes to these numbers and ultimately how the numbers play out on earnings. Path is doing well, up 10%. Leaning even more heavily into those higher end customers. He did note profitability coming not just from cost discipline, but also, as he put it, strategic aggressive investments into AI. Remember, UiPath had historically centered around robotic process automation, that the strategy is continuing to shift, saying they're seeing, quote, tremendous amounts of opportunity, even among those bigger spenders, as Gen AI unlocks more and more demands. In terms of the industries that are driving the most demand, healthcare, financial services, there's some oil and gas, there's some retail on the grocery side particularly. And interestingly, the public sector, as the IRS and USDA are using UiPath to automate processes and are some of those customers that are in fact continuing to expand. You can see shares of UiPath are up 8% right now in after hours on these results. Yeah, moving around a lot. There you go, path is up. There you go, Robin at 1759. Yeah, the street likes the numbers, guys. Street likes the numbers. They like the fucking numbers. I wouldn't be surprised if this bad boy shoots to 18 tomorrow because it's very simple. By the way, put in the chat if you own Robin Hood, dude. Put in the chat because I never asked like, who actually in the chat is in, is in this trade. Who owns it? Um, the, the, the thing about their crypto revenues is I estimate through my projections that they will do $20 million for every, call it $6 billion they do in trading volumes. They did $6 billion last quarter or last month. They did six billion this month, so you got forty million. If they do seven billion, eight billion next month, you're gonna have another twenty. You're gonna have sixty million in crypto equities. You're looking closer to about fifty to eighty million. Options is gonna be closer to about a hundred twenty, hundred thirty million. Rates are still high. They're still collecting the five percent off everything else. More deposits mean more money into their cash sweep product, which means they give more APY. They get more uh, interest commissions that they that they get for the customers. I mean, I don't know how they don't have a blowout quarter, and they're gonna be gap profitable. So to me, I'm just like, well, wait a second. The, the, and they have $6 billion in cash. So the street's going to look at these numbers like, wait a second. We know they're going to crush. We know March is great. Well, so far, so far, March has been really good. Bitcoin obviously at all-time highs. Users are going through the roof. Downloads are going through the roof. Deposits are going through the roof. They're going to be profitable. They're one of the only profitable you know, companies that exists uh, in that kind of market cap range, right? Not a lot of these companies are profitable. I don't even think Path is profitable. I might be wrong. Let me know in the chat, but I don't think they are. Which means if that's the case... I, like, like, there's no reason for this to be below 25. I think if they have a monster earnings, I think, I think this thing pumps. And on top of that, if you get Bitcoin closer to 80k, like when you're trading eighty thousand dollars of Bitcoin on Robinhood, they're making a good amount of spread. They're making way more than they were making when it was at fifty thousand or sixty. So, like, to me, the narrative is set up for them to pull a Coinbase type of move. I think people forget Coinbase went from thirty bucks to two fifty two. Robinhood doesn't need to do a seven x. I'm looking for 25 bucks, you know, I'm looking for from 10 to 25, which I don't think is that crazy, especially because all the catalysts are set up. And then they have their credit card launching, which is going to be another stream of revenue that Vlad is very excited to be able to get into. And he talked about that in their interview over the, over the weekend. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Okay. A lot of people in the chat have hood, a lot of people. I just wanted to, I just, I just wanted to see how many people actually have it. Yeah. It seems like a decent amount of people have hood here. Calls. Sean has calls. I think there's zero reason to sell. I agree, dude. I mean, if I kept my $25 calls that I bought at $10, I would be up a lot more money <laughs> than I'm up right now. But even me, see, as deep as I was on hood at 13 bucks, I was like, all right, it ran from 10 to 13. I should take some profits. I didn't fully get it till 14. That's when I doubled down again into a different spread position. And I was like, all right, let me, like, we had a core position for 2026. And then I got some 2025 calls and I was like, this is happening. Like, it's pretty obvious. It's not it's not a joke. And so it is what it is. It is. But, but like, I think the numbers here are, are evident. There's no numbers. I'm looking at that February data that makes me wonder that my thesis or that quite frankly, all, all of our theses on hood is incorrect. Like, and I've, it's so funny because I've stared at the January numbers. So many, dude, it'll be like 2 AM at night and I'll pull up. I will literally pull up the Robin hood IR in my, if you looked at my phone on the frequently, yeah, frequently visited, I'm looking at Robin hood investor relations. Cause I just look at these numbers and I try to ask myself, like, is there a way I could be wrong? And what I'm looking at is, I don't think there's anything bad here, dude. Equities up, 
Crypto's up. Margin's doing fine. Options are up aggressively, dude. 19 minus six is what? Uh, uh, what's 19? 13 million more contracts traded. And then assets under custody up 16 billion. Like, I just, I don't think they're... The only thing I wish I saw a little bit more was on the users, but I can't be... You know, 130,000 users is 130,000 accounts. Look at this, dude. This is what I mean. Look at January 2023 until December 2023. You see how January 2023, there were 23 million uh, users? December 2023, 12 months later, there's 23.4. <laughs> like, these guys barely could add users for a year. And then in two months, they go from 23.4 to 23.5 to 23.6. That to me is pretty rapid growth in March, I think is going to continue on that trend. And so there you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. That's what we got. All right. So that was the big Robin Hood news. Not bad. Path right now still up uh, currently. And uh, Tesla is obviously the other issue we have right now. Path up 6%. So Path went down from 12% down to 6%. Now it's up 6%. MicroStrategy as well. It's pumping another 2% after hours. If you have MicroStrategy options, you are up hundreds of percent, if not thousands of percent on these options. If you got them at 450, 600, 700 strikes, I mean, and you probably, if you have time, if you have till 2025, you have you have uh, many, many months uh, for this to play out. If Bitcoin gets closer to what I think is going to start to happen, $100,000, MicroStrategy is getting, MicroStrategy right now is a market cap of 30 billion and they're sitting on 7 billion in profits. So MicroStrategy's market cap, 30 billion, 29 billion, 7 billion of profits. Bitcoin gets to 150, let's say it doubles. They're going to be sitting on 14 billion of profits. What does that do to the multiple? I think that at least brings up the multiple by two. So it goes from 30 billion to 60 billion, which means the options theoretically can triple and quadruple, even quintuple based on the type of option you have uh, if, if the market cap doubles there. And then um, and then, it, and then if, if, if a lot of FOMO gets in because MicroStrategy is going to the moon, it's not going to stop at 60 billion. It's going to get closer to 70, 80 billion. By the way, MicroStrategy is one of the next contendants along with Palantir to be included in the S&P 500. And that's going to be another pump that pushes this bad boy. And so it's kind of just like, it's kind of just like MicroStrategy is one of those things where as long as Bitcoin remains high, it seems like this is a better play than Robinhood. This is a better play than uh, 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 the ETFs. This is a better play than Beto, which are the Bitcoin futures. This is the play. Now, granted, I do not think you should FOMO into MicroStrategy right now <laughs> because, you know, I mean, it's it's just not, if, you, if you're not in it, you're not in it, right? It's, it's hard to chase this thing now. I'm sure there's a way to chase it, but you really, you're, you're going to be risking a lot more than if you did before. Um, you usually don't want to buy options on something that's run up like what 600% in the past like couple of months or something it's hard to time those but it does seem like market strategy is going to be one of the core bitcoin proxy plays right now and we'll see what happens we'll see how this plays out i want to show you guys a couple of things and then we'll watch the carp interview also let me know in the chat do you guys want to watch meet kevin's uh tesla short thesis he did a 20 minute video we can watch like 5 minutes of it to get the gist of it let me know in the chat if you want to watch his 20 minute thesis or not 20 minutes like the 5 minute version of his 20 minute thesis we'll take a look at that and then we'll watch Carp as well because I know we gotta we gotta watch Carp. Chris, you gotta get on the pod today. Chris is in the chat. Chris, you gotta be. I know you're in New York, dude. Call in, call in for at least the first segment uh, because we definitely gotta talk Tesla tonight for finance junkies. We we've gotta talk Tesla. Okay, I want to show you guys something right here. Uh, you know Josh Brown, right? The CNBC contributor. He did a podcast with his friend, and they talked about which companies can be the next Mag Seven. So, what are the next seven companies that could be the next? Um, like, you know, the next max, the, 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 in 20 years, which are the next magnificent seven when, you know, Tesla, Nvidia, Amazon might not be there. Take a look at this list. And I want to know if you guys agree with it. AMD, Uber, ServiceNow, Fiserv, CrowdStrike, Palantir, and Atlassian Corp. These are the seven companies these guys think can eventually become the next mag seven. I thought this was interesting. First of all, they usually don't talk about Palantir. Josh Brown doesn't talk about it too much. They have a pretty big podcast. So, I mean, they, they have a, a decent amount of reach. So, they, they them bringing up Palantir, I thought that was interesting. Uber, I think, is 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 possible. I think if they figure out the stuff they're doing in the air, I mean, they're, they're, they're massively profitable now. S&P 500, they basically have a monopoly. I mean, Lyft is Lyft and no one cares about Lyft, right? Like Uber is, I think it's very possible. At last and kind of confused me. I don't know why that one. I definitely have to look deeper into that. CrowdStrike, I think, is very possible. Cybersecurity demand is not going anywhere. And then AMD, I feel like, is a cheat code because it's a semis play. So you're not really taking a risk by saying AMD. They obviously have to grow, but like AMD is just another NVIDIA that's kind of just like smaller. So, like, I mean, yeah, AMD is very possible. But those are his seven. Those are his seven. 
And um, I think that would be really interesting to see what these companies would be like. Obviously, I think Palantir would definitely uh, <laughs> would definitely would definitely get there as well. So as Sean says, a big great topic for you. What happens to stocks after they are off the S&P 500? That's a good point because we saw Zion Bank that got outside and Whirlpool that got outside for SMCI and Deckers. Zion's up a little bit today. That's a regional bank. That makes sense that they fell out of the S&P 500. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what companies get rebalanced on the next rebalance, which I think is in June, the next rebalance. We have a couple months until the next one happens. Um, okay, do we want to watch the Meet Kevin thing? Do we want to watch it like five minutes? Yes or no? I I I don't I don't I think I missed the comments. Yes or no? If if we have like more no's than yeses, we'll just not watch it. Uh, do you think Adobe is a good play? Adobe at these levels, I'm not that excited about their market cap, quite frankly. But I do think they're a hell of an AI play. Dude, generative AI is Adobe, right? Premiere, video editing, all that stuff is generative AI. So, uh, but I do think they they run up, but dude, they were 275 a year ago, so they definitely doubled. So they've had a run as well. Um, <laughs> dude, there's too many, there's too many yeses. Look, we don't need to watch it. The only reason I was going to pull it up is just to, it's like an analyst on CNBC, right? Just to get his perspective. That's it. Just to get his, uh, his perspective that we have. We have more no's than yeses. <laughs> I think we have, more, uh, we have more. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to do a poll, dude. I'm going to, I can't, I can't do this from, from just looking at this. I'm going to do a poll. We'll leave it up for two minutes. And in those two minutes, we'll go back to a video. I showed you guys this morning that I want to show you guys again, because this, this video is going viral. And then based on the results of this poll, we will make a decision. So it'll be democratic. No one get upset about it. It'll be yes or no. Meet Kevin five min video. Yes or no. Okay. All right. So while we're waiting on that poll, I've got to show you guys this video again. And I think it's worth watching. Remember the video I showed you this morning about figure and what they're doing with robotics. I think Elon is going to get upset at this video. This video has gone viral. You guys remember CERN Basher, the guy who's a, an expert on robotics. He was on my channel uh, on Lunch with a Mitt on Friday. And we, he said there's a $600 trillion TAM. And he really broke down the numbers for humanoid robotics. Uh, he was on a live stream with Brighter with Herbert. And they were looking at the figure video. This guy is not emotional. He was crying, dude. He was crying at this video. This video made him... And if you guys saw the podcast, you know he's not the most enthusiastic guy when he talks right amazing analysis but he's not like he's he's not he's not out there when he's talking like that he doesn't care that much he just likes to get to the numbers he was crying when he saw this video let's watch this video again this is what the future may look like we figured out how to train voice we trained text we trained video the next evolution is training robots and embodying ai so let's take a look at this and then we'll talk a little bit more on this partnership and I, what i think elon's going to do in response to this video because i don't think elon's going to let this video get, go viral without him giving a response. Hey, figure one, what do you see right now? I see a red apple on a plate in the center of the table, a drying rack with cups and a plate, and you standing nearby with your hand on the table. Great, can I have something to eat? Sure thing. Great. Can you explain why you did what you just did while you pick up this trash? On it. So I gave you the apple because it's the only uh, edible item I could provide you with from the table. Great. So based on the scene right now, where do you think the dishes in front of you go next? The dishes on the table, like that plate and cup, are likely to go into the drying rack next. Great. Can you put them there? Of course. All right, so how do you think you did? I, I think I did pretty well. The apple found its new owner, the trash is gone, and the tableware is right where it belongs. I agree. Thanks, figure one. 
you're welcome. If there's anything else you need help with, just let me know. Okay, so first of all, that's insane. Second of all, everyone's saying it's stuttering. You guys have to realize why before you rush to the conclusion. The voice on the robot was fine-tuned. So this was not just like a Siri type of voice. It had text-to-speech and it was AI fine-tuned. What does fine-tuned mean? When you're fine-tuning an LLM, like Hobbits, right? The LLM I created about Pound here, you're trying to make sure the model gets better and better at articulating itself. That model, when it's fine-tuned, particularly on a certain voice, so it's... Uh, they, like they had to make that voice, that voice is being fine tuned on the data coming from that human. So if that human is saying things like, uh, that becomes a part of that vocabulary. It's like a human. That's kind of the point. That is why it's an AI generated voice. This is the CEO right here saying, Hey, can anyone identify the person behind the robotics voice? And so that's what we're looking at right here on this. Now, a couple other things from what uh, the CEO says, and we'll talk about the implications on Tesla in a second. He says, two weeks ago, we announced Figure plus OpenAI are joining forces to push the boundaries of robot learning. Together, we are developing next generation AI models for our humanoid robots. It's been 13 days and we're excited to share today's updates. This video is showing end-to-end -end neural networks. There is no telop. Also, this was filmed at 1x speed and shot continuously. As you can see from the video, there's been a dramatic speed up of the robot. We are starting to approach human speed. Uh, Figure's onboard camera feeds into a larger uh, vision language model, VLM. I've never heard of that. Uh, term before. Okay. Figures neural nets are also taking images at 10 Hertz through cameras on the robot. The neural net is then outputting 24 degree of freedom actions at 200 Hertz. In addition to building a AI figure is also vertically integrated, basically everything, motors, firmware, thermals, electronics, et cetera. And then they're showing you about how they're creating the factory, the actuators, all that stuff for the robots. Uh, by the way, the guys that, that led this work was a dude from DeepMind, this guy named um, Corey Lynch. So the, if you look at Figure's LinkedIn, they're recruiting and they're stealing basically everybody from DeepMind and they're 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 getting him, them to come here. So in the context of Google, I mean, if you, if you wanted another bear case on Google, which I don't think is necessarily a bear bear case for the stock, I think the stock will be fine, but they are losing talent to startups like Figure that are doing things that are a little bit more important than AI advertising, right? And so that's what we're, we're, we're getting there. So Sean right here says neural language processing and T2V is designed to sound human-like, pauses, uh, uh, and oh, et cetera. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, and you kind of want a robot to say, uh, you don't want them to be super robotic. Ironically, you want them to be like a human. So now what does this mean for Tesla? Okay. I think Elon is upset. Last time Figure put out their two videos, the day after, literally midnight, Elon puts out a video about Optimus. Remember he put out that potato quality video and then they have to re-upload the video. I think he doesn't like that figure that just raised a lot of money is getting a lot of uh, brand recognition for this robot, especially because Optimus is kind of what got people thinking about robots. I think they're going to put out an update. Now, here's the question. Does Tesla have the ability to do what that figure bot just did on a robot uh, in the video? I don't know. We're going to have to see. But if they do, I don't think it's, it's about hiding it anymore. I think they have to show it off. Otherwise, the world is going to start thinking maybe Optimus is not as advanced as we think it is because all we've seen Optimus do is walk. And like, it's like, okay, you know, it's, it's not that big of a deal. You got to like actually do reasoning. And that's why that partnership with OpenAI is pretty exciting there. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. But I think Tesla stock that's already under scrutiny right now, Wall Street does not give a crap at all about the bot. Uh, and that's one of the benefits to startups. Wow. Tesla looks like it's going to go under 169. One of the benefits to a company like Figure is that they don't have to worry about shareholders like Wall Street. They, they, they can just execute. Elon's worried about SpaceX. He's worried about Neuralink. He's worried about the boring company. He's worried about immigrants coming over the border because he's made it a mission to care about that. Uh, and now he's worried about, obviously, Tesla, margins, compression, FSD. I mean, there's just a lot the guy is going on. And I respect the, the living hell out of that. It's just, dude, the, the, it, you don't know if they're going to be that focused on the bot if they're this focused on a trillion other things. So it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Tesla, 169.12 right now. Obviously, a pretty bad day. And uh, you know, the one thing I do want to say from when I was listening to me, Kevin's video, let's see what the poll says. The poll says yes. Okay, we're going to watch five minutes. The poll says yes. We're going to watch five minutes of it. Uh, let me pull up the video. One thing he did say towards the end of the video was that people have a lot of money in Tesla. I think people forget there's people in their older age that Tesla's their retirement. Like Tesla is... Is, is, is their portfolio. Like they, they bought into the vision and maybe at 200, at 210. And for a while they were up 
a lot and they're in, you know, they're older people. And so they can't really lose that money. Tesla can't go to 60. But like th those are people that like, what happens if you need money for medicine, right? Like you need that thing to be stable. So Tesla going down is not just some fun little, oh, Tesla's going down. Robin at 1768. Awesome. 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 Up 3%. Uh, Tesla going down is like, there's very big implications in, in for everyone for Tesla going down. It's not just like a, oh, Tesla's down by the dip. It's like, no, 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 no. There's hundreds of billions of dollars that depend on Tesla not, you know, shitting the bed. And when the guy you invested in is talking about politics all day, I think it just it can get people upset. It can get people a bit upset. All right, let's listen to a couple of minutes of Meet Kevin. I think regardless of whether you like him or not, we should hear at least a little bit of his thesis. He did trim for those that are joining Tesla. He had like uh, 80,000 shares. Now he has 36,000 shares and he is shorting Tesla. So let's hear a couple minutes of his thesis. It's more macro related and then we'll talk about it. And then, then we'll react to Carp's interview, the full 15 minute interview. We'll react to it live uh, after this. Here we go. Short Tesla. I really hate to say that and it breaks my heart. I also feel stabbed in the back because that might be what you're feeling. You might feel like, wait, Kevin, how could you do that? You love Tesla. And that's true. I do. You know that. But I feel stabbed in the back. And a lot of it doesn't even have to do with Tesla. It has to do with what I think the Federal Reserve is about to do to us. And I don't think people are paying attention to it. In this video, I'm going to explain. You say we should watch the last five minutes, not the first one? Okay, so let's do that. Let's do the last five. That's actually better. Okay, so the minutes, 29 minutes, we'll start at like 25. We'll see what he has to say. We'll do the last five minutes. Here we go. Seeing an impact. Robin at 1773. All right, up 3.5% after hours. From the disruption in the Red Sea. Well, guess who does get impacted by the Red Sea? Like literally everything has just been designed to take Tesla and ream it. Tesla gets affected by the Red Sea because their shipments from China have to go and, and uh, the South China Sea have to go through the Red Sea to get up to the German Gigafactory. Well, now they got to go all the way around. It takes 30% longer, double the cost for freight. Great. On top of that, you're getting more incentives, more incentives on America, 5K supercharging miles, uh, Cybertruck shareholder incentives. That's not a gift. That's to try to finally motivate some more people to spend a hundred grand on a truck you know is going to be worth like 70 or 60 a year from now. And so now this doesn't even have to do with the Wells Fargo, uh, you know, downgrade. Who cares? All the analysts, they just downgrade whichever way the stock is going. So I don't really care about that. But there is a real risk of Wall Street still has not updated. Still today has not updated the consensus estimate because it takes long for these analysts all to come in with a new update. They still haven't updated uh, EPS projections. You're still sitting at $3. Okay, well, that's based on 490,000 deliveries in Q1. Troy Tesla thinks we're going to come in like 410,000. If we come in at 420, we're still negative year over year. What if we're negative next year as well? Well, I don't know. It's all speculation. But the whole point is that between now and the end of next year, the tailwind of rates coming down probably isn't going to happen as quickly as we thought. And it's entirely possible that maybe, maybe all of a sudden rates come down quicker than we thought. And you know what? Then I'll be right back to buying. And if I have to buy at $200 because, you know, you sold something in the 170 joint, oh well, so be it. it. It is worth not getting screwed with this sucker going down. I hate to say it, but we are we are right now under the 175-ish, 176 fib. You know where the next stop is on this sucker, right? It's not good. You can pray. You can pray that the next stop is over here at like the 148. But that's a that's not the best trend line, okay? I got like three or four points of data over here and they're not even that clean. So that's a weak trend line. You know what is a strong support? 101. You know how many margin calls are gonna happen between now and then? I think the Fed, based, like, basically, think of Tesla as like this dirty uh, uh, coffee-stained napkin, okay? Like, it has a lot of potential. I could unfold it. I could go, oh, I could do a lot of things with this. I could make a paper mache. You know, I could do a, a little robot or batteries or maybe a semi-truck or whatever. But what are we going to do in the meantime with this? Well, we're going to go in over here and go, Red Sea. Oh, interest rates. Uh, oh, NEM3 and solar. Oh, uh, what, you know what else? Elon politics. Oh, Twitter financing. Oh, uh, the uh, you know lawsuits around the comp plan. Oh, board selling. Oh, no guidance. Oh, okay. What about margin? Oh, okay. Look, FSD 12, by the way, I got the latest updates. Better. Finally, finally. Like I think of it as net better, but are people going to pay 12K for it? No. So what else are we getting? Discounts. More discounts. More discounts. The Cybertruck list, like everybody I talked to who's ordered a Cybertruck early on, they've already gotten their invite and they're like, yeah, I'm going to pass for now. So you, you end up having this like hobium thing, but it really just looks like shit. Uh, and, and again, you know, I'm not trying to be emotional here. I'm just saying, I think it's unfortunate the situation Tesla is in. And uh, I don't think all of the bad is priced in yet. So, dude, watching someone talk that fast and doing technical analysis is actually hilarious. Like when he's like, when he's like, I've got, I've got the, the 165 fib, the fib when he's talking that fast is hilarious. He's not faster than me yet, even at 1.75 speed. But there you go. So that's his analysis. If you wanted to know why someone is publicly shorting Tesla. Oh, uh oh, Robin Hood, Robin Hood. Are we hitting 18? That, that's his thesis. Ultimately, that's what his thesis. He thinks the Fed's going to mess it up. Interest rates are high and it's, it's going to be very hard for Tesla to recover as a result of that. Wow. 1814. Holy crap. Holy guacamole. 
Holy guacamole. Oh my goodness. It's up 5.5%. You know who that is? I think that's an institution, guys. I don't think that's retail buying it. You don't move 6% after hours on, on I, I think that's a toot that came in and that was like, fuck it. We got to buy this thing before it goes to the mood. There we go. We finally broke through 18. We needed to get through 18 and we got the, now, okay, so it's, 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 it's right there at 18. I, I don't know if it holds 18, but at least there's enough pressure to get it there. If we can get 1820, that would be incredible, dude. If we can break through 1820, that would be amazing. Not bad. Not, not, not bad. Look at that green candle. There you go. The results were good. The results were really good. The only thing I would like to see is a little bit more on the user side. But I mean, like maybe if they added 10, 15,000 users, that doesn't matter. Like what matters was deposits and trading value. Oh, 1820. 1820. Hold on. Are we going to 1830? up 6.3 percent are we going to 1830 we're at 1824 right now 1837 let's fucking go <laughs> holy crap oh my god yeah this is definitely an institution this is not retail this is not retail are we doing 1840 are we doing 1840 we just hit 1840 you guys can see this right yep you can see this 1837 oh boy dude this is a type of rally that retail is going to look at tomorrow morning and be like shit i need to get in this because you know what the narrative is going to be? You know what the narrative is? The narrative is going to be, this is Coinbase when Coinbase was 80 bucks. That's what the narrative is going to be. As long, 1840. All right, we're 1844, 1846, 1840, 1849, 1852, 1856, 1860. What the fuck? <laughs> Who's buying this, dude? Who's buying this shit after? It has to be an institution. 1864, 18, 18, 18, do we get 1870? 1865? Oh my goodness. Holy crap, dude. Holy crap. 1860? 18, I saw 18, 1870! 18, oh my God, dude. What a candle. What a freaking candle. There has to be an institution that said, I'm buying. This is not retail. There's no way retail is moving it this, this quick. I, th I was happy with like 2% after hours. I was like, that's great. We got to 1750. <laughs> We're there. Oh my God, 9%. You saw that red candle right up there? 1874. It just jumped from 8.74 to 9.2. 1867. Wow. Maybe ARC. Yeah, maybe ARC's buying. Maybe ARC's buying. Maybe. 1870, 9%. Maybe it's ARC. I mean... It, we, we already know they have 91% institutional ownership, right? So uh, so if they have that much institutional ownership, I, I mean, there's obviously institutions that haven't bought in yet, but most of the stock is, the float is institutional. It's not even retail. So there's definitely shares out there, but a bunch of the toots are in. Maybe they're buying more. Maybe they're adding to their position. They're increasing their averages. They're like, holy crap, this quarter is going to be amazing. Dude, Vlad is fucking proving that he is a founder extraordinaire. Vlad fucking started this company. He's an immigrant from Bulgaria. He got a $25,000 check from Jason Calacanis, 1870, at a bar in San Francisco after graduating Stanford with a math degree and said, you know what? We're going to challenge Schwab and Fidelity. And right now, these numbers that they're putting up. Now, look, Bitcoin's helping. Bitcoin's helping, but the fact that they have a product to ready that's ca capitalizing on that Bitcoin right now, 73,139. Wow, man. Dude, I didn't expect an 8% pump. Uh, you guys know me. I like to lower expectations. I did not expect an 8%. I, would, I, I, I thought 1750, 1760 was going to be really nice. Now, the key thing tomorrow is, here's the other thing. We have no vol volume shelf resistance above uh, 19. That's another technical term. I'm like, dude, I'm going to be a fucking male astrologer by the end of this year, dude. I am going to understand TA. But in terms of volume self-resistance, which is the historical amounts of volume that are above a certain price target or above a certain uh, level in the stock, which certain price, there's none. So from 19 to 33, this thing can fly. Like this thing can legitimately fly. And, and it could be a pretty epic run, especially if Bitcoin then gets to close to 100K. This is when competitors start looking at acquiring. Yeah, and here's the question. What is Robinhood worth? Their market cap is going to... Wow, 1885. Oh, do we hit... Dude, do, do, if, if we hit 19, are they going to let us see... Is it going to $19 after hours? Is that actually about to happen? By the way, I mean, a lot of people think Robinhood should not even be below 20, so, including myself, right? But I didn't expect it to happen after hours. So if it did go at 19, I, I most people would say, 
it, it deserves to be there. Um, 1883, 1883. Wow. 9.85%. If it hits 19, that's going to be incredible. Will it hold tomorrow morning? I actually think it has a chance, dude. Will there be sellers? Of course. But do you really want to sell after this pump? Like, I think a lot of the people that were just were buying it at 15, 16, 14, if they just understand a little bit of the narrative, they're going to realize there's no reason to sell and they're going to hold a little bit longer, maybe until 2022 before they dump. Like, there will be a dump tomorrow. I don't think it will be that aggressive of a dump, just given the narrative that's going to be articulated in the morning from people under trying to understand what's going on. 9.85, 9.67. We're trying to get those last 10 cents to 19. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. 20 would be crazy, dude. <laughs> 20 would be fucking crazy. It would be wild. Uh, just 19 would be incredible. Um, Fisker is going bankrupt. Yeah, Fisker is down 50% right now as well. Hood is only 8% short. That's correct. Hood is only 8% short. 7.5%. But who's 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 counting? <laughs> dude, I just I know the metrics of this company, dude. I fucking... I've studied this damn stock because I have a lot of money on this and I think I'm going to be right. And this will be my first really big win in the stock market. Palantir is obviously Palantir. That's a long-term hold. This is going to be a really big win if it plays out. And so we got to see this thing play out. But I think the numbers are there. And the shorts also, I mean, 7% is not enough for a squeeze. But I think if you're short and you see Bitcoin going up, you're going to cover your short, dude. You're not going to keep your short when Bitcoin's going to 80, 90K. Because you know Robinhood is the one of the only brokerages that doesn't charge you a literal arm and a leg to be able to sell crypto. I'm going to try to pull up a tweet I saw this morning. Uh, someone tried to sell their Solana on Coinbase. It charged them $1,000 in fees to get rid of their Solana. Like it, 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 it's just Robinhood would never, I think the most Robinhood, unless you have some ridiculous number would be like, it's a 0.35% spread, right? So maybe you pay a couple hundred bucks, but like, it's just ridiculous. I think people are going to realize there's no reason to short that thing. And so that might, uh, that might help it go higher as well. Uh, <laughs> y'all are looking at the new meet, Kevin. Yeah. Chris knows my full Robinhood position. Um, so Chris, uh, Chris knows that I've got some money on this one, but look to me, I, I, oh, by the way, uh, if you saw Chris's picture, so if you were lucky enough to see Chris's tweet, he deleted it because he felt a little bad. But Chris showed off his Celsius gains. I was the only person on the planet that knew about how much he was up on Celsius. Obviously, you guys know he bought options at a, at 50 bucks. Celsius is almost at $100 today. Um, he put the picture out and he deleted it because he felt too bad, which is why you know Chris is a good conscious. He doesn't like gloating and all that. Uh, but if you were lucky enough to see the tweet, you know how much Chris is up on Celsius right now. <laughs> so... Um, Chris is, Chris is, Chris is doing his thing and hopefully Robin can also, you know, see some gains as well. 8.86%. It's going to fight for this 1870 range. I can't even say I'm saying it's fighting for 1870. I was maybe hoping we hit 1760, 1770 tonight, but we'll see. We'll see where it goes. Uh, Sean says he's in $20 leaps. Yeah. I think that makes sense. I think that makes sense. If I kept my $25 leaps, they would, I mean, they would be up close to 60, $70,000 guys. I sold those for 5,000. So you got to really know what you're doing sometimes on the exits of these. I mean, I, I've left basically $55,000 on the table. So, I mean, it, it hurts to say I still have a heavy position, but sometimes you, and, and sometimes you don't develop conviction until you really see the story. And I thought I understood the story in uh, February. I didn't really see it until the end of February, quite frankly, uh, or like middle of February. So it is what it is. This is, this is how it works, but uh, this can, you know, Position sizing can can really magnify the gains. Right now, up 9.32% here on Robinhood. Oh, Crossroads, you're in weeklies. You're in weeklies, huh? You're playing with the weekly $17 calls. I I I didn't I don't do the weeklies. So yeah, those are gonna print for you as well. Those are gonna print. Weekly 17s are gonna be okay. Um I mean, I missed the early part. If Hood doesn't charge fee on crypto deals, who pays for the gas fee after all the trades on it? No. So Robinhood charges a 0.35% spread. Um uh, Coinbase charges, I don't even know the exact number, but it's an insane spread. Like it's an insane uh, spread. Um, and, and they charge a network fee and a gas fee. So they charge all those, but even the network fee is, is, is so small. Look, let me show you this. Let me show you this tweet. I found this tweet right here. Let me show you this. So this was, uh, this was January 3rd. I tried to send Bitcoin to someone. I tried to send them like, um, like a thousand bucks or something. A uh, hood network fee was $4. Uh, $9 in total, right? The amount plus the fee. Coinbase was $18. See that? So this is what I mean. They charge a fee, but it's so minimal that I think a lot of people are just like, well, why am I using fucking Coinbase 
you know, Coinbase has a monopoly in this. I get it. But why am I using Coinbase if, uh, if I could use Robinhood? And so Robinhood just doing even a little bit of what Coinbase did. The stock's at 30 bucks. Like we're going to see 30. And it, and it wouldn't be too bad. Um, I never do weeklies, but I did a play yesterday. Okay, so <laughs> Crossroads got <laughs> Crossroads. I think you knew the numbers were going to be good too, right? And so that's, see, I thought the numbers were going to be amazing, but I still was scared to do weeklies because I just, like at this point, the stock really has to break out before it can break out. Like I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not at the point where I'm like, I definitely know what's going to go here. I think by the end of the year, I can have that understanding of the price, but not by the end of the week. But yeah, there you go. I think it's an institution, guys. I don't think this is retail. I don't think this is retail. There's no way this is retail. There's no way this is retail. This has got to be 10%, dude, come on. 10% on 900 million shares outstanding. There has to be some retail here. Sean says, first goal is to win. Second second is getting entry and exit right. You are winning. Yeah, that is correct. We did make some money. Uh, just just a little bit too early, but at the end of the day, make because to me, when I was up 50%, I was like, damn, I'm up 50% of my money. That's good. I did not know I could have been up like 400% if I waited three weeks. But this is, this is how the market operates, right? Shit, you know, this is, this is at, at least you secure something and then you just have to do proper risk mitigation and really have a thesis. I have a friend who in December started loading up at eight bucks and I met them over Twitter and we just started going back and forth. And they, they, what really gave me another piece of conviction, I met a random stranger over the internet that called Coinbase at 30 and, and he sold out of Coinbase at 170, left some money on the table. Sure. But he decided to pick up Robin at eight. And when I, I DM'd him, I'm like, yo, what's your thesis? He was like, dude, this is Coinbase. This is like, like people don't realize the Bitcoin ETFs, everything, this is Coinbase right now. And it's trading at cash. And so I was already in Robinhood, but when I had that conversation with him, I was like, yeah, maybe this is a little bit deeper than, than what all of us think. And so that's what we're seeing right now. Um, does Kathy buy after hours or not? Kathy, this is Robin is already 5% of her fund. I don't think she's buying. If I had to, you know, gun to my head, I would say she has a lot. If anything, I think she's probably going to sell and take some off the table, but someone's buying, someone is buying and maybe it's Kathy. Maybe it's not. I don't think it's retail, dude. I don't think Robinhood moves up 10%. Tomorrow retail will buy and they could, maybe they push it up another four or 5%. But I think after hours, it's uh, it's institutions. All right, there we go. Congrats to Robinhood shareholders. We'll see what happens now. And 7% um, short, the shorts are probably gonna, I think they, they're, I, look, if you're short, I like, I don't know what the thesis is to double down on being short for SoFi, the dilution. Maybe that's a part of the thesis is not the best part, but like, maybe that's an argument. Wall Street doesn't like SoFi. Maybe that's an argument. There's a bunch of little arguments you made on Robin. I don't know what the, like, no, this company's overvalued at 15 billion trading with 6 billion in cash. No, uh, you know, they're not Coinbase. No, they're, they're the equity. Like the data, we saw the data, the data is, the data is really good. So I think it, the shorts will cover and that should create a little bit more buy side pressure. And maybe 18 is the new normal for, for Robert. Uh, is this Buffett's secret stock, dude? If this is either, okay. So Buffett's secret stock is either PayPal, maybe Robinhood, probably not Robinhood. Charlie Munger would not like that. Uh, in fact, they've criticized Robinhood in the past. They just don't get it. They don't like it. Or it's Tesla, dude. If Charlie, if, a, if Warren Buffett comes out today and says he buys Tesla and that's the secret stock they've been accumulating, I mean, dude. The entire, I think the entire financial universe would, would erupt if it's, if it's freaking Tesla. It's probably not Tesla, but if it's Tesla, uh, after hours, what do we have? Let's see what other stuff we have after hours. So, uh, clean spark is down after hours, just a little bit. Micro strategy is down just a little bit after being up 10% of the day. Um, um, blah, 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 blah. Where's the other ones I want? Okay. Palantir PayPal is down a little bit. Palantir is still at 25. Palantir is at 2506. Not bad. Soundhound. Wow. Dude, what the hell is going on with SoundHound? It was up 24% today and now it's up 11%. Is there any news on this thing? Let me look it up. SoundHound stock. Is there any news on this? Why is this up so much? I don't see any news. I don't know if anyone has anything in the chat. I, I see, oh, NVIDIA's GTC conference. Maybe, I see a couple articles here. Maybe investors think there's going to be a collaboration at GTC, which is happening March 18th. Uh, and they're going to present something. Maybe that's a little bit of a stretch, but maybe, maybe that's, that's one of the reasons, I guess. Um, outside of that, I, I don't understand. Why is it up 11% after hours? Like, what did they do? They were up 24% today. Why are they up 11%? I don't know. Buffett is huge in BYD. Yeah. I forgot about that. That's also true. HPE, HPE. I think it could be a June. I think that's a good one. I think it could be HPE as well. 
I think it's possible. Uh, that's possible. Wow, Meet Kevin's ETF is up 3.5% after hours. Is it because Nvidia's up? Is Nvidia up? Is that's why? No, Nvidia's down. Me this is crazy. Meet Kevin's ETF is up 3% after hours after being down 2% of the day, and it's probably because he sold Tesla and people bought the ETF because people wanted him to sell Tesla. Dude, that would be crazy if his ETF is up 4% after hours because of his sell of Tesla. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Uh, Amit, what is your cost on SoFi? My big position on SoFi, which is not a huge position, but it's a $17, $20 January 2026 spread. And I have those at 25 cents is the spread. Uh, if it gets to 20 bucks, the spread will be worth $3. So three divided by 25 cents, it'll be a decent return. Uh, but that's kind of the main position I have right now. Uh, sounds up almost 40% insane. Absolutely insane, dude. Where's Robinhood? Let's see. Let's go back to the hood. What do we got on Robinhood? Up 1848. Let's see. Let's see, man. Let's see. We got, we still got, by the way, Robinhood overnight, the party starts at 8 p.m. So at 8 p.m., retail might say, fuck it, we're going to FOMO into Robinhood. We could see some momentum at 8 p.m. Bust this sucker. Maybe it's even 19, but we'll see after hours how this, how this ends up playing out. Okay, let's do CARP. We got to do CARP. We haven't watched CARP. I'll do another video later today. Uh, you don't have to watch it because I'm going to be reacting to CARP and giving more commentary. But uh, if you haven't seen it, we need to watch it. And let's see what CARP has to say. This is the uh, uh, CNBC interview he did today. Uh, shout out to Palantir Vision. I'll put the link in the channel, in the chat. Everyone should subscribe to him for cutting this up and bringing this out here. Oh my God, Sailor's doing another 575 million? No way. No way. No freaking way. No way freaking way hold on hold on hold on hold on there's no way oh my god he's doing it oh my god he's doing it he's doing it micro strategy is raising another 500 million of convertible senior notes that's gonna buy them basically another eight thousand bitcoin and this is gonna be executed probably in like a week or two holy freaking crap dude bitcoin's going to the fucking moon and so is robin hood because this is this is good news for robin hood dude because what's good for robin hood is what's is, is bitcoin's good for robin hood bitcoin's good for square bitcoin's good for micro strategy bitcoin is good for clean spark michael saylor is single-handedly pumping all of these different stocks because eventually this is just going to put more buy side pressure on bitcoin is Sailor buying this using his hood account? Could you imagine? He puts a video and he just like swipes up on $500 million. By the way, Robinhood is not going to give you the best spread on your crypto. So please, if you use Robinhood, use a limit order. Like their spread, like I think Bitcoin was at like 71000 I put it at a dollar to like buy. And, it, and it, <laughs> my spread was like 71800 I was like, okay, so that's, that's, that's a horrible spread. So please set a limit order if you're doing crypto on Robinhood. But um, it doesn't seem like uh, Sailor has a limit order or a fucking limit with what he's doing. The reason this is so significant is because they did they did 600 million two months ago. They did 820 million two weeks ago. I'm sorry, two two days ago, basically, like a week ago. Um, and, and they executed two days ago. And today they're doing 500 million. Now, again, again, why is this happening? Okay, why is this happening? The simple thesis, uh, which uh, Michael Michael Saylor liked uh, my tweet today when I when I put up his video, um, but the thesis, which is what Saylor is excited about and what this, this tweet actually caused a lot of controversy. Let me show you guys this tweet. I tweeted a couple of days ago. People were really upset. People thought it was a Ponzi scheme. I don't think this is a Ponzi scheme. I think if Bitcoin falls, the whole house falls down, but I don't think this is a Ponzi scheme. Saylor is doing something very simple. He is collateralizing the company, which is MicroStrategy stock, which is primarily based on Bitcoin to be able to raise money to buy more Bitcoin. As a result of doing that, he is able to get money from debt issuers at a very low APY and never have to pay back the debt because he pays them back in MicroStrategy stock. Now, if you're a bank, if you're JP Morgan and you're giving Sailor 500 million, do you want 0.65% APY? Or do you want MicroStrategy stock in, in like in three or four years? Well, if you believe as the debt issuer that Bitcoin's gonna go up because that's the only reason a debt issuer would give Michael Saylor this money. If you are bearish on Bitcoin, you are not giving Michael, uh, Michael Saylor the money because you know this house of cards is gonna collapse if Bitcoin goes back down to 10,000. So any institution funding him right now believes in the Bitcoin thesis. They believe in Michael Saylor's strategy to buy more Bitcoin. Right now they're sitting on 7 billion of profits. If they buy another 8,000 Bitcoin, that's gonna be another couple billion when Bitcoin doubles, if it gets to that 150-ish range. 
And then boom, in a couple of years, they're going to just dilute shareholders with stock, but no one's going to care because the stock's going to be up one quintillion percent that you don't give a shit if you get diluted. And that's how it works. And that's how it works. And, and so they never have to pay back the debt because he just issues more shares. It is actually one of the most, I don't want to say genius, but it, 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 cause, cause it could all collapse. But as a theory, it is very interesting. And if it works out, it's going to be genius because we know the dollar's inflating. We know the dollar is eventually going to be debased give, given sort of how much debt we're printing. Now, maybe that doesn't happen, but like, like it's not a good trajectory. We're doing a trillion dollars of debt every 120 days. So what has value? Something that's scarce, something that's digital. You can get it to hold a Bitcoin thesis. The whole world is revolving around this thesis becoming real. BlackRock and Fidelity haven't even gone to their biggest clients to sell them on the ETF. And then boom, you get all this upside momentum. MicroStrategy stock is like, well, let's just buy something. Instead of buying New York real estate, let's buy Bitcoin. And then as, the, as Bitcoin goes up, the stock goes up as well. And so there you go. They're up 7 billion right now. They're up 7 billion on Bitcoin. They have, and the market cap is only 30 billion. Uh, because they 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 have two hundred thousand Bitcoin at a thirty thousand dollar average, and Bitcoin's at seventy thousand, so they're up uh, six billion bucks. So there you go, MicroStrategy breaking news. All right, let's get into the Carp interview. For those that haven't seen it, it's an epic interview. Here's Alex Carp on Palantir and short sellers today. And is sitting down exclusively with Palantir's Alex Carp. It was one of the best parts of the interview. Everyone is claiming to do things. We are showing them being done. I mean, like, dude. If you're a C-suite watching this interview, you're, you're given a call to Palantir Sales and figuring out what they can do for your company. Um, we are sort of... Okay, so that part of the interview, I don't think he had the, the short selling part because uh, I don't know why that part of the interview didn't... Oh, let me let me get the... I, I have the other part. Let me... Unless I missed it. I don't think that he said the short seller part. Let's, let me get that part of the interview. That was the best part. So uh, I have a lot to say on this interview, but let me get those final couple of minutes where he's talking about the shorts. Because that is, that is, people don't watch TV anymore, but that is TV, dude. I think that's what got him going viral today. So shout out to John, uh, putting their Twitter in the chat. They cut this hole up and they post it on X. So let me see right here. Um, oh, here we go. Here we go. This is it. And then he'll talk about Israel as well and some other stuff. So here, I think it's here. One second. It's loading, Twitter video loading. Twitter just said their video product is growing so well and the video is not loading. Okay, here we go. Using software and that, that we support Israel. That, that's the sense. First of all, we won. Eight American companies. As it relates to the battlefield, you know, you're, you're talking. Come on, man. Come on, man. That was epic. That was epic. Guys, this is actually happening. The freaking company we've been analyzing on this channel together for the past three years, tweeting about it, YouTubing about it, fucking pound to weekly 112 episodes or whatever we're on. It's actually happening. Yeah, Robin at 1858 up 8.28% right now. What we thought was going to happen is happening. And Carp's executing. And the company's doing it. A couple things from that interview that I thought were really important. First on that short seller line, um, I think the... You know, it, it kind of was spontaneous from him. I don't think he actually planned to do that Coke line, but you know, Carp has his euphemisms, right? Uh, cockroach.com. Uh, he's on this whole uh, self pleasuring wave now with LLMs doing poetry, self pleasuring themselves, right? Like, so he has these euphemisms that he pulls out. Uh, PowerPoints has been something for a couple of years, and he throws them out at these conferences, at these keynotes, and he's just like trying to make his point. By the way, you need that as a CEO, dude. Like, like CEOs need to resonate with the world. To, to, to take their company to, we're talking about Palantir, what, 500 billion, 600 billion? He's got some work to do at 50 billion. He's got to tell the entire world what they've built, right? It's marketing at the end of the day. But the reason their stock is up so much is because they finally in Q4 showed execution behind the marketing. So Carp's eccentricities around how he communicates and how he how he gets his messages out there, how he gets philosophical, how he rambles and all this, sometimes it, 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 it always doesn't work. But when it works, it really works. And what is an example of it really working? An example is a C-suite that's watching CNBC today that wants to implement data and analytics in their company that has heard of Palantir, but they th thought of them as some black box spy company. And they see this guy with this crazy hair basically saying that the short sellers are high on cocaine if they're shorting my company. That C-suite, I think, is, is Googling Palantir right now. And they're trying to figure out what is this company? Because, I mean, it's someone who gets your attention. Sometimes you either got it or you don't, dude. You either got it or you don't. And Carp has it. He can get people to listen. Uh, Alex Chris, 
my opinion, PayPal doesn't really have it. He doesn't really inspire, right? And it is what it is. So if you are someone who can inspire, you have to embrace that 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 aspirational level of your personality. And then you have to actually execute against that. And in this interview, I think that was a masterclass of showing it off. Second thing outside of the co uh, cocaine line was the line about showing value. So one of the arguments that he says is, um, or what, uh, what Sarah Eisen asks, uh, why are you doing boot camps? Why are you stressing so much about boot camps? His argument is because we are showing the value of our software. And the best way to do that is not through a steak dinner or through a PowerPoint, but legitimately through executing a boot camp, which takes more money. Uh, it takes more resources. It takes a bunch of different things that, you know, like a company has to do to be able to execute that. But once you get someone locked in, I mean, the conversion on that, we've seen it in the numbers, is astronomical. And these Q1 numbers, I don't know if they're going to be an NVIDIA type of quarter, but I'm starting to believe by Q4 2023, the, if, they, if they keep scaling boot camps, you know, 10, 20% month over month, we are going to get a, a, a quarter where we add like 100 to 150 customers. We barely added 47 last quarter. And before that, we were, you know, maybe adding 23, 24 every quarter. Uh, same thing like Robin, right? They could barely get 20,000 accounts. So this quarter, they added 130,000. They basically 10x the number of accounts they added um, in one month. Forget one quarter. So I think Palantir is entering a stage of hyperscale. Now, look, 20% year over year growth is not hyperscale. I will admit that. Totally understand. But 70% US commercial is. The question is will the government business be able to reaccelerate? so that the US commercial and commercial writ large doesn't have to subsidize the lack of government growth. Maybe that'll happen, maybe that won't. Titan is very encouraging. I did a video yesterday about a $10 million electromagnetic warfare contract that they got, so you can watch that. That that That's showing me more signs of acceleration. And then on top of that, are they sandbagging this 20%? Are they sandbagging it right now? Robin at 1850 right now. Are they sandbagging? Because if they're sandbagging, then we know that there's not gonna do 20% year over year growth, dude. This is gonna be closer to 25%. But if they, if they are... Uh, if they're not sandbagging, then yeah, the growth is not going to be amazing. I just don't think you have a CEO talking like this, uh, you know, being so being so out there about their numbers and their confidence if they if they didn't have the numbers. Now, look, Carp's always been confident since the stock was six bucks, but this is a different type of confidence. This is not just we're the best five years from now, everyone's going to know. Yeah, that, that's like more philosoph philosophical confidence. This is like mother effer. We are doing 850 boot camps. We are growing 20x our pilots from last year. Like this is not just confidence. This is like confidence in the context of execution. And that's the best type of confidence because that's the confidence that's going to get people to buy your stock. Palantir right now after hours is at $25.08, up 0.32%. Maybe 24, 25 becomes a base and uh, it consolidates until we get the next leg at, at, uh, at what are we looking at? At, at, at uh, 30. And we'll see. Tesla's at 168. Oh boy. Tesla, 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 168.65, down another 0.5% after hours. Um, Yeah, it's not the best, dude. It's not the best. I mean, like, there's nothing else to say. There's nothing else to say. It is it is what it is. I mean, Tesla's just, they have headwinds that they're dealing with right now. I am very curious to see how Elon's going to uh, deal with this over the next couple of weeks. Does he put out a video to go against Figure's new video? Does he continue tweeting about, I mean, let's see what, I haven't checked Elon's Twitter all day. Let's just literally, like, let's say we're a random Tesla shareholder that doesn't follow him on Twitter. Let's say you logged onto his Twitter today. What would you see? Let's see. <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. I don't mean to laugh. <laughs> I, don't, I, I swear, I did not look at his Twitter all day. I did not know the first thing we would see was woke ideology wants you to die. Look, I kind of agree with them. I'm not the biggest fan of woke ideology. But this is also why I think Tesla people are just upset right now. Because it's like, dude, like, like, yeah, this matters. But like the stock, like our life savings, like that also kind of matters, right? So that right there, not necessarily the best. Uh, then he said, free speech is the bedrock of democracy. Okay, that's fine. I agree. Um, just posting so the public knows how crazy this is. This is about Venezuelan, uh, Venezuelan illegal immigrants. Okay. Uh, teach a people to teach a people to hate themselves and their history and they are defenseless against mind viruses. Uh, they can be reprogrammed with ease. Okay. Interesting discussion of how mind viruses are created and amplified. Okay. Uh, thanks for the hard work of Tesla Giga Berlin. All right. So there's some Tesla stuff. There you go. Some Tesla stuff. Boom. Uh, good summary of the history of slavery. All right. So this, this is what I mean, dude. Uh, 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 a Joe Biden, a Joe Biden, uh, not Joe Biden, a Joe Rogan clip. Uh, this one was actually a fun one. I, I did see this last night. The scam coins are getting crazy. One, uh, someone just shilled me a scam coin, and it's uh, the U.S. dollar, twenty-seven trillion unlimited supply gap. So this is actually a fun one. This is a fun one. But this is my point: is just like uh, you know, I, I think I, his tweets are not the reason it's down, it, but it's definitely not helping 
Tesla shareholders deal with some of the pain. Now, granted, maybe the pain is is limited and the pain will be limited for, for the downside, but as of now, it's not in the best situation. Tesla 168, where's Palantir up 0.36%, 2509? Where's Hood? Where's our good old Hood? Uh, Hood is up 7.5%, 1843. Soundhound, guys, is just mooning. Soundhound, uh, SoFi is up 7 point, SoFi is up 0.52%. Soundhound is up 15%. I don't know what the hell is going on with Soundhound, dude. I don't know. It was up 24%. It's up 15%. Who's in Soundhound? Don't lie. Put in the chat. Who's in Soundhound? Who's who's gambling in Soundhound? It's okay. We won't judge here. We won't judge. Now, if I was in Soundhound, everyone would judge me. I know that. I know that. I know all of you would judge me. You'd be like, look at this degenerate gambler putting his money in. Which well, you would kind of be right, by the way. You, you would be right with your judgment. I was going to make a point. You would all judge me if I was in it. But I will not judge you if you're in it. Especially if you make some money, dude. Especially if you make some fucking money, make some money in Soundhound. John's in Soundhound. Um, Eric, I think, is in Soundhound. Sandra's in Soundhound. <laughs> Ian says he's judging. Um, Nelson, I only put 500 for the ha-has. I love it. Bay Ray says, I put 185 into it on earnings and sold for like a 20% loss. Wow, Bay Ray. So you were hiding that you were playing earnings on Soundhound. You, you kept that information from me. Interesting. I'm in a group chat with you every day and you don't... Uh, you don't disclose these things. Very interesting. Very interesting, Bay Ray. No, but I think Soundhound, it pumped like 40%. Let's look at it on the year to date on Soundhound. It pumped a lot a couple of weeks ago, and then it fell off after those earnings because those earnings were good, but they weren't phenomenal. Um, or they weren't phenomenal for the, val for the valuation. But right now they're at $10, dude. And I think the street just brought them back or retail brought them back. Year to date, wow, look at this chart. This stock in Jan dude, this it, it hurts to see this sometimes, dude. Like, I'm happy for people that make money, but the stock was one dollar, two dollars. It's 10 bucks. <laughs> oh, it's a 500% return from the bottom, dude. What the hell? It's crazy, 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 crazy. Barry says, guys, he never reads our messages in the group chat. He would have saw it anyway. That's because you guys send like 5,000 messages a day because you think that, like. You think that everyone has time to read messages, dude. I'm like, I'm like, I'm doing other things, but I try to respond to them. But Soundhound right here, 380%, incredible. Look, if you're in it, my only advice would be if you're up 380% on a stock that has a $2 billion valuation above $2 billion now and doing 47% year-over-year growth with $80 million in revenue that's not profitable, I think at least consider maybe taking some profits. That's it. That's what I would say. But if you want to let it ride out, let it ride out. Who knows? Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Uh, Barry says, because we're friends of it, this is normal. Yeah, but I thought you said I didn't have friends. So I don't really know what friends are at that point. I don't know what friends are. Uh, let me get to some of these super chats. Uh, Alan says, Alan, thank you for the $10 super chat. Got into some leaps with you. Thanks for the money. Awesome, man. Thank you for getting, thank you for the super chat. And um, hope those leaps print for you, which it seems like they are. So awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. 1836 right now, up 7% on Robinhood. Again, anyone who invested in Robinhood, and, and you did it because you saw, you know, some of my due diligence, that's fine. But at the end of the day, you had to pull the trigger. Same thing with me when, you know, when I invested in TFC because of Chris, it's like, yeah, Chris had great due diligence, but I had to pull the trigger at the end of the day. Like once you finally buy it yourself, you're responsible. And so it's, it's a big responsibility buying an individual equity, much less options on an individual equity. So congrats to anyone who, who got in and is doing good. Uh, Surge says $5 super chat BBIA going to run as a sympathy play from Soundhound. Mark this post. I don't have a dog in this fight. Go PayPal and hood. So BBAI big bear is down. I believe from their earnings, like 30%. They are up 5% after hours, 5% on the day. They were at 430. Right now they're at 2.4. Uh, they did have a pump before earnings. They were up like almost 200, 300%. And then they crashed after earnings. So it could have a sympathy pump. That's possible but we'll have to see if it plays out. Wow, Soundhound's up 20%. Holy crap, dude. Holy freaking crap. Goodness gracious. <laughs> That's incredible, dude. <laughs> it's up 20%. What the fuck? It's up 20%. Why not? Why not? It's up 20%. Let's do it. Let's do it. It was up 24% today. If it was up 20% after hours, I wouldn't care. It was up 24% already. So it's up 44%, dude. Goodness gracious. And I don't think there's any news other than maybe an NVIDIA conference partnership that they're going to look into. Uh, YouTube user says, any advice for Tesla bag holders? I think the advice is to DCA, dude. There's no other advice. You're not, you, if you have a 220 average on Tesla, 
stocks at 168. You're not, you can't sell. I mean, you can, but like, why? Like, like at this point, it's kind of like Poundtree when it fell to six and all of us were at $19 averages. Like, why would we sell? Like, it's kind of, you're, you're just like laughing into the sunset and you just hope that the shit comes back. And so my advice would be to stop worrying about the position unless you need the cash, put on an auto DCA every month and forget about it. And it'll come back. Tesla will be fine, dude. Tesla, I, I don't think Tesla's at risk of bank. It's like Tesla will be fine, but it's going to be, it's going to be some short-term pain. Maybe 125. I don't think I think 150 is max. I think Wells Fargo 125 is stupid. I don't think I think the dip is going to get bought heavily. This is still a company that's going to deliver two million vehicles this year, right? Um, but it's one of those things you just can't pay attention to. It's like Palantir for 2022. We could not look at that thing because it was seven dollars, eight dollars every day, dude. You just had to buy it and shut up. And I think Tesla might have the same thing this year, which is okay. It's an accumulation year. Now, if any uh, hood Q1's April 25th, I don't think it's April 25th. I know Seeking Alpha said that it's probably in May. Uh, cause they haven't put out the numbers yet, but it's going to be around the time. Now, if your thesis has changed around Tesla, that's a different story. I don't think anything in the Tesla thesis has changed. Optimist call option on Tesla FSD basically going to be solved. Hopefully by the end of this year, deployed by 2025, um, uh, they have the best EVs in the world, right? I think that's obvious margins eventually will bottom out volume of deliveries. It'll take some time, but it'll get there. The, some of the biggest institutions in the world are on your side, right? This is not like you're not alone on an island here. It's actually easier to hold than it was at Pounder at $6 because there was literally no one outside of Mariana from Bank of America that kind of liked this. Even Dan Ives wasn't, you know, the big rock star on Wall Street was not talking about Pounder at 6 bucks, dude. We did not have that support. So I think if you're a Tesla shareholder right now, you have tons and tons of support. You just have to wait it out. I think you just have to wait it out. Um, ba, 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 ba. Amit, did you see Kevin is shorting Tesla? Still a good company. Yeah, yeah. Now remember, Kevin's shorting it as a trade. He he thinks that the Fed is going to screw up um, the meeting that's coming up, and that they're going to not necessarily tank the market, but they're going to show that inflation's stickier, and Tesla and N phase in particular are going to have a tough situation. Let me pull this up real quick for those that didn't see this. This is a uh, what um what Kevin tweeted today around around what he did. So he sold Bill.com, he sold N phase, and he sold Tesla, and he bought. Restoration hardware and Wayfair. Wayfair is the, uh, uh, it's the fucking, um, it's the, the, uh, the mattress company, I think. Like they sell, they sell furniture and shit. So that's what he did. And then this is the positioning. Let me pull up the Q3 holdings of his, of his, of his thing. So this is what he had. Let's look at it. This. this is what he had in July, 2023. He had, um, these are the holdings. Well, yeah, yeah. Let, let, let me pull up here. He had he had about thirty six thousand shares of Tesla, and he has similar to the same, but he did sell a a, a bit today. So share this tab right here. So he has he sold like a thousand shares, right? Nothing too crazy. Uh, End phase Apple's at nine thousand eight hundred shares. AMD at fourteen thousand. Tesla again, he sold a little bit. Nothing too crazy. Pounder sixty thousand shares, and he has an eighteen dollar average there. He has a ton of uh, uh, two year Treasury notes. PayPal, he still has 14,000 shares. Intel, 52,000. And NVIDIA, 5,000. Uh, wow, I didn't know he had 52,000 of Intel. That's a lot. That's 5.86% of the fund. So Tesla's 16%. Uh, Enphase is 12%. And then NVIDIA is 13%. NVIDIA should be carrying the fund because I think he has like a $600 average there. Maybe even lower, actually like $400 average. But Enphase and Tesla, he has like a 180 on, on Enphase and then like a 250 or whatever on, on Tesla. So he didn't sell a lot of it today, but he is shorting it as a trade. Uh, Soundhound now up 16%. And, and as a result of that, there is a position for it in the portfolio, but it's not, it's not a huge position, even though it is the, the top holding of, of the portfolio. It is starting to slightly come down, even though it's still you know the top holding. The question becomes, if Tesla gets down to that 150, 160, does he buy more there or does he sell more there because he thinks it's going to 130? Or does he start selling as Tesla gets to 165 before it gets to 145? I don't know. We're going to see what he does. But that is kind of his position. Ross Gerber basically sold out of Tesla. I don't think he has any more Tesla anymore. He has like a thousand shares, maybe. Um, and then Gerber Kawasaki, or not Gerber, uh, the Gary Black, he also sold a bunch of Tesla as well. He has more Rivian. So all of these guys are selling a bit. Dan Ives is the only one who's saying, hey, things are going to be okay. But kind of the main Wall Street guys, they have Tesla, but they are upset at Tesla. And so... Um, that's kind of how the story is playing out. But in general, the, the, the final advice is I, I would just DCA and, and hold on to it, especially if you have a big average, because it'll be back 
just might take a few years to get there. Um, Robinhood right now is 1830. So we're still up 6% after hours, a little bit of sell side pressure from that 1870 range. We'll see if we can hold 18 after hours. Uh, I think tomorrow this thing flies, dude. I think tomorrow the market opens, retail realizes, holy crap, Robinhood's the future. It's actually happening. And I think they buy the stock. And I think $19 tomorrow is very possible. Tesla 165 could be possible. But I also think, I think the dip could get eaten up on Tesla. I think the sentiment is so bad right now that the dip could get eaten up on Tesla. Everyone knows Q1 earnings are going to suck, but I still think people will be like, you know what? Like it's Tesla. And I think the dip could get eaten up. But maybe we see some momentum there on Robin tomorrow after our same story with Meta in 2022. Yep. Now the only difference here is Meta had some tailwinds. Tesla in the next 90 to 180 days, I don't know what the tailwinds necessarily are outside of rates coming down. And those rates, are not coming down probably till July, which is why Meet Kevin is shorting Tesla right now. It's like a one month trade for him. Meta's tailwinds are that the valuation was ridiculous. Tesla, I don't know if the valuation is ridiculous. It's it's definitely attractive. I don't know if it's ridiculous. Meta had a $200 billion market cap doing 60 billion in revenue. Like it was absolutely insane. It was a PE of six, dude. Tesla's still a PE of 58, right? So Meta was just insanity. And then on top of that, um, you had AI fueling Meta. AI advertising is was their future. They bought a crap ton of H100s and then the ad targeting got so much better. TikTok started to decline. Boom, there you go. You got meta. Uh, Rumble amid consider a position. I have looked at Rumble's financials. I don't like them. I know the stock is pumping. I think it's a little memeish right now. Rumble's like the competitor to YouTube. Stock's up 2% today. It was up 7% yesterday. I looked at their numbers, dude. Their numbers are not good. Not to me. They're like, uh, unless they had some really good news. Also, who uses Rumble, dude? Who really watches it? I know they have like 80 million users, but does anyone here in the chat actually pull up Rumble? Do you actually. Like in, when you want to sit down and watch something, do you go to Rumble or do you go to YouTube or Twitter? Like, I just, I don't think Rumble's the, but I think it will pump on the meme-ish kind of element to it, but I don't think it's the, I don't think it's the growth story people think as like a competitor to YouTube. So not the most exciting for, for me. Uh, I know Andrew Tate uses it, but dude, Andrew Tate's audience is not the global audience. I mean, look, I know he has a big following, but if you're going up against YouTube or Twitter for that matter, I think you need a lot more content creators than Andrew Tate. And look, they've signed a bunch of exclusive creators, but like, that's just not enough. The, the moat of these social platforms that have network effects that could lead to algorithmic discovery. It's, 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 it's it, only Nvidia's AI moat. I think, uh, uh, compares to that type of moat, a platform that can get you discovered. And that has billions of users, YouTube at 2.3 billion. Like, dude, that, that moat is is huge. Now, look, it might not make that much money for Google. I think YouTube is actually a loss leader. I know they do $9 billion of revenue. I think a lot of that is actually losses. It's not just pure profits for YouTube, for Google, but it's a big moat as a platform, you know? And so I think it's hard to, to go against that. Um, okay, I think that's pretty much it. I feel like there's one more thing I want to show you guys, but I think we looked at Meet Kevin. We looked at crypto. Uh, we looked at Michael Saylor. Yeah, the breaking news today, Michael Saylor buying $500 million of Bitcoin for those that are just joining that broke 20 minutes ago. Tesla right now, 168.58 after hours. Um, oh, this is what I wanted to show you guys. Okay, let me do this real quick and then I'll get you guys out of here. I wanted to see what Gary had to say today about Tesla. Okay, so this is the tweet I wanted to show you guys. Just to show you a little bit more of Wall Street sentiment. So Gary says, uh, what ails Tesla? It's increasingly difficult to justify a 55 to 60 PE on a company with single digit year over year sales growth until the next generation, 25,000 vehicle delivery start in 2026. Got to give Gary credit. He's been saying this for basically six months. He's been saying there's no way we can justify this multiple if they have single digit sales growth and the $25,000 car is the only thing that's going to uh, improve it. And I think a lot of people are realizing that he's right about that. And interest rates not coming down anytime soon means that that single digit year over year sales growth is probably not going to be higher. So unless Tesla can really kind of figure that out, that's why it's going to be in a little bit of a, a little bit of an issue, a little bit of a pickle, a little bit of a squibble over the next, uh, over the next couple months. But granted, I don't think we see 120. I don't think we see that. And maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think we see that. All right, cool. That's it. Thoughts on Snowflake. When is a good time to enter? Dude, after watching that Palantir interview, I don't even think anyone can touch Snowflake. I mean, look, you can you can buy it as a trade. Maybe it pumps to 180, but I think it's very obvious the street has realized and they're going to continue to realize and some of that institutional float of Snowflake. That's what 65% Palantir, 41%. I think we're going to see a little bit of a convergence in the next 12 months on that. Snowflake, 162. It's up 0.22%. It's down 35% after earnings. If you want to swing it to 180, I think that's very possible. But uh, I think if you're looking for a real investment, I think it's I think you just buy more Palantir, quite frankly. I, re I really do. That's what I think about it. Um, okay, Robinhood after hours right now, uh, 1823 up 6.24% 6 and Palantir 2511 up 0.42% on the day. 
All right. So that's it. Having said that, me and Chris will do a podcast on Snowflake. We still have to do it. He's, he was in New York this week. That's why he's busy. Next week, we will do a podcast on it. So we'll still do the podcast. But personally, uh, I think Palantir is, I think that interview today kind of showed what's going on with Palantir. Okay, cool. That's it. Thank you, everybody. I will see you guys tomorrow, 8.45 a.m. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. If I don't say it enough for joining these market closes and market lives every day. I looked at my analytics today and um, on the market open, we were averaging close to 1,200 people every morning. And on the market close, it's basically about 750 every single day. So I think if we just keep doing what we're doing, I get better at my analysis. You guys keep abusing me in the chat and keeping me humble every time I make a joke that is funny, but you don't want to laugh because you think it'll overinflate my inflated ego in the context of my humor. I think if we keep on that track, and if Robin Hood and Pounder go to the fucking moon, <laughs> that we will keep growing this whole media enterprise and it'll bet it'll get really exciting over the next year. So thank you everybody for being here. Bay Ray, that's really racist. He said, thanks, Amit. Come again. That that was racist, but that's okay because it was a funny one. So we'll end it here. Thank you. Please come again. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a good one. Good night.